Again, my name is Terry Shriver, and I work for the uh, a state and federal agency. Uh, we are Wildlife Services. We're part of Texas A&M, and we're also part of the United States Department of Agriculture. We deal with all manner of wildlife problems. Some of the things it's easier to tell you what we don't deal with than it is what we do deal with. I don't deal with snakes, dogs, and alligators. Pretty much everything else we deal with. Uh, feral hogs. <laughs> feral hogs. We deal with feral hogs. Uh, that's turned into a full-time job over the last few years. Uh, but anyway, I'm in the Fort Worth district, uh, which covers pretty much from Wichita Falls down to Temple and over to uh, Nacogdoches in this corner of the state. There's two of me uh, in the district, and I can't begin to tell you 67, 58, I don't even know how many counties that I cover. Uh, but I feel wildlife problems, uh, again, from A to Z. Today, uh, I'm gonna visit with you about some of the problems that you may encounter if you're trying to raise fish. I don't really get into the law of a lot of things. I'll kind of cover and touch some of the, uh, uh, the issues with law as we go along. But if you have a question where, a question where something is legal or not legal, um, you need to call your game board. If you decide you uh, need to take something that's questionable. Some of the things that uh, we're gonna consider today are lethal and non-lethal methods mechanical, chemical, biological controls, and being able to identify what some of the problems are. Again, I work a lot of different wildlife problems. About a month ago, I worked a place that had beaver problems. And it was a little small tank, and the lady's husband was a doctor, and his, his pet were catfish. He called me out for beaver problems, and she told me he was really broken hearted because he found a dead catfish on the bank, and he's got a little small pond, maybe four times as large as this room, and she figured it died and it couldn't save it. And I went over and looked at it and walked around the tank, found about four more catfish, and they all were probably in the range of seven, eight pounds. All of them laying there just inside the water, and I told her, I said, I don't think this fish died uh, by itself. It had been eaten up, and I saw the droppings, and, and doing what I do, it was kind of easy for me to tell what was wrong, but the otters were just eating her fish alive. So I, I went ahead and did some beaver work and I was sitting on the dock one evening, watching a couple of cormorants sitting on stumps and one of them jumped in the water and he'd jump up on the bank or he'd pop back up out of the water. And you would be amazed at how many fish and how large those fish will be that they can eat. And I mean, it's just, on, on this slide presentation that my supervisor put together, one of the deals that uh, I saw was, it said they eat one to one and a half pounds of fish per day. I watched these fish, I couldn't begin to tell you how many pounds each one of these fish. There wasn't that many, three or four, but I mean just again and again and again. So what appears to maybe not be such a big problem, if you take a little time and just set the woods or set on the stump and watch the water, you'll be absolutely amazed at all the, uh, the preloaders. Again, the, the legal status, and I'll tell you what's legal and what's not on, on some of the obvious. Uh, the groups of vertebrate pests, the reptiles, mammals, and birds that we'll cover today. Here's pretty much what I don't deal with. Uh, I'm from West Texas. When I moved in over here in 96, nobody heard the word about alligators. And I was mucking through the swamp, and I had a landowner with me, and he went blowing a whistle on me. What are you doing? Well, I'm calling Charlie. And instantly I thought, dog, he's got a water dog that I wasn't paying attention to. No, he was calling his alligator. So they've always been a snag to me. I do not like them. I, you know, I'd much rather deal with rattlesnakes than I have alligators and water dogs. So we don't deal with them. Uh, and if you have questions about, are you able to take alligators? I so don't even know anything about the hunt of alligators. So I can't help you there. Uh, the river otters, boy, if they ever get in a little small time, they'll, uh, they'll put you out of business or knock his way down. You have to be pretty agile and uh, aggressive to be able to take the size catfish that these otters were taking. And they were catfish every day on the bank. Pretty, pretty good sized catfish. As far as being able to trap otters, we trap them all the time. 
for the most part, we're trying to remove beavers, and they follow the same pattern as beavers, follow the same trails, uh, coming and going where the beavers come. Check with your game board on that, because I know you have to have a fur bearer's license, and when it, when it comes to depredation, you may be able to get by without having a trapping license or a hunting license, but I would definitely check with the game board on that. The beavers, I mean, I have, I've had several calls over the last, oh, 15, 16 years. Hey, I've got beavers in here and they're eating my fish. Beavers are strictly vegetarian and won't eat the fish. You couldn't force one to eat your fish and starve to death. But the damage that they do are on your dams, your dikes, your impoundments, and they do a pretty sizable amount of damage. I've worked a lot of SCS lakes and RCS lakes up north where they've created over $4 million in damage on a dam. You know, you've got a lot of houses below these flood lakes, flood control dams, and left unattended. Those beavers, when the water comes up, those beavers will uh, eventually break the dam. So if you have beavers, that's really something that you need to look at taking care of because it doesn't fix itself. You won't always see it. If you, have, if you didn't see it this year, you may not have them as low as the water got. They'll leave a hole below the water level. When the water level drops, then you'll be able to see their entrance. They just go under the water and build, dig up into the dam. Left unattended, they will break your dam. Uh, but again, they don't eat fish. Mutra are the same way. Uh, I'll get calls saying, hey, I've got Mutra on my place. I need you to come get them. They've built a hut, a lodge, um, whatever they've done, dug holes in the dam. Otters, or excuse me, Mutra do not build anything other than a little grass pad. So if you have two sticks any bigger than my pinky finger, you have beavers. That's not nutrient. In most places, the nutrient population has gone way down because the beaver population has gone way up. They really don't cohabitate that well. Uh, they certainly won't be living together. And, and that's pretty much true with the otters. The otters will be there if the beavers are there, but one of the ways that I can tell that I'm pretty much done trapping your beaver problem is I start catching otters and I'll catch them in the lodge where the beaver were living on the entrance, but I've never caught an otter where I have beavers still living in the lodge. These are some of the, the problems that won't create a, a direct problem with your fish, but they will certainly mess up your, your tank, your pond, your water supply. Uh, the raccoons, really, they're not going to create a problem. I, they're not, you know, the only thing they're going to do is get in there uh, with their arms and, and their hands and feel around there, catch whatever they can catch. This may be caught in a small hole of water, but the raccoons aren't really going to create a problem. Uh, again, here's some of the, the, mean, the methods to be able to catch them or shoot them. I have four wildlife specialists that travel in East Texas area, and each one of them is broken down into certain sections, and they travel from county to county staying in the county for a month, four or five weeks, and if they're not a big problem, they stay less. But they actually come to the county, go through the county agent, say, hey, what kind of beaver problems do you have? The county agent usually keeps a list. Uh, and he'll go in here and he'll track your place for free. Come back when he has, you know, the next time he comes back around, if you have beavers again, or when you notice they showed up, then you go back to the county agent and say, hey, put me back on the list. And that's in every county in East Texas. Uh, and that's a free service uh, that our beaver guys provide. Again, for that, just contact the county agent because all of them in, in East Texas are aware of our agency and most of them keep a list. Some of them you go through the county judge. Uh, it just kind of depends on how it's set up. We have uh, county trappers in a couple of counties in East Texas, but uh, they're pretty much over in DB Texas. Here's the beaver deal, trapping them, shooting them with spotlight, I mean, using spotlight. It's kind of effective for just a lay person that wants to go out and take care of the problem, but probably more people are successful at it than I'm aware of, but people who call me, hey, I took my 30-30 out there last night and I didn't do any good. Well, that's the absolute worst gun you can use um, because you're guaranteed to get a record shot. You need a fast bullet, uh, so if you miss the beaver, because the beaver's gonna be moving, it'll be in the water, and it's like shooting half of a softball moving at night while you're holding the gun and the spotlight is not very effective. If you can wait and if you're calling the county agent because you have a potential damage on your dam 
Wait a couple more months won't hurt a thing. Probably better not to uh, educate the beavers. And there are a lot of private people that actually do that, that kind of work. So I wouldn't completely leave it unattended even if you think, well, I just don't see anything. They can't be doing much. But they're, again, the holes are under the water, so they're creating more problems than what you think. The nutrients, again, they don't chew anything. They're, they really can be there without you knowing because they're not going to chew any sticks, leave a dam, build a dam, or a bunch of sticks on the dam. A beaver lodge, I'm sure everybody's familiar with a beaver lodge. While I have you, just for a second, your attention. On a beaver lodge, if you see a beaver lodge sitting out on the higher end of your tank, your pond, on the side, anywhere that's other than on the dam, I get a lot of people that want to burn those. Oh, I'm going to burn them beavers out of there. What you've done is you just moved them to another spot, we're going to have to go find somewhere else to live. Invariably, they're going to go to the tank dam to dig a hole now. So if you have a lot, leave it there. You're not going, you will do absolutely nothing by removing or burning the lot, digging it up, whatever, fill it with water, smoke, because you're going to move them. Just well have them in a harmless spot than on your tank dam. Again, the raccoons are really not, uh, they're not going to really create any problems at all. Then the birds. Uh, we have cormorants, pelicans, herons, eagers, osprey terns, kingfishers. Unless you're running a fish farm, it's kind of tough to get a permit, and we'll get into permits here in a minute. But in order to get a permit, which is called a Form 37 from the federal government, and this is what we have to go through, you, you have to go through our agent. You can go to your county agent, and he will give you our information, and you can get in contact with us. Because you can't take any of these. I mean, if you shoot one that's carrying your grandkid off. You're in trouble. Can't do that. Uh, you can you can harass them and move them, but that really doesn't do any good. We go out and we shoot them and we shoot them off the roof. And pretty much all we do is we've killed a couple of hundred at night off of one roof when they're coming in. They're not very smart. It takes a couple of nights of killing a hundred or two to actually move the roof. Don't shoot any of them unless you have a permit. What you'll do is you'll file for this permit. They'll go through we will come down and assess your problem, say, yeah, okay, here's some documented this, and we will tell you what to document before we get there, and we'll look at your damage and we'll suggest, yeah, we need to be able to take 100 cormorants, 12 egrets, whatever we suggest. We send that to uh, Denver, and they'll come back with a minuscule amount of, uh, of birds that are, you're allowed to take. But it's something, it's, it's some semblance of help. Now, of course, when we go in to do something, most of the time we deal with the lethal methods, and we strongly suggest trying non-lethal methods next, da, 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 but I mean, if you don't have a million dollars, that's kind of difficult. Harassing, uh, and we do a lot of this in, in towns where it's not feasible for us to shoot. Red laser's pretty effective, uh, but it's not absolutely not great. You know, you, you have to either sit out there or hire somebody to sit out there. In the end, it's just, I, and I'm not really supposed to say it, but it's not really cost effective to put somebody out there and jump up and down with a pot of paint. Bang. Some of the things that they uh, do is they do change the behavior of your fish. Uh, you know, if you're used to fishing here and, and doing this a certain way in a certain spot, they definitely will change. I've actually seen fish learn, you know, you put a board out there or some boards out there or a dock, they learn to get up under this so they don't get caught. So the fish are actually learned that. I learned that out in West Texas years ago. The herons drop in these big cisterns, 15, 20 feet across. And if you just put a board out there, you can, you know, they fill the, the little water tanks or cisterns, concrete cisterns with fish, trying to keep them cleaned up. And the herons are feeding on them terribly. But they learn to get under a board if you put a board under there. So if you can just amplify that in big body of water. They'll stay under vegetation. So again, if you do have a problem, uh, there's a Form 37. It'll come through us, i.e. through your county agent. He'll get hold of us. I'd definitely call the game warden. Uh, he may be able to assist you and tell you, you know, maybe you can do this or you can do that because it's so interpreted. The pelicans, it said here again, I think, um, cormorants. I don't know if I got to that one. Okay, it says eats one pound of fish per day, less than six weeks. To prove that to be wrong, just by watching. Uh, 
tell you he's one to two, uh, two pounds fish a day. Can't imagine stopping one little fish gonna be that tough. You know, they're really, again, I, I would strongly suggest sitting down on the tank and watch what's going on. If, if it's during the day, if it's in the morning, in the evening, at night, especially, well, I would just suggest the period because you may find a problem that you don't have or you may find out what it is that's creating your problem. If you're losing fish or they're not showing up, wonder why, well, you know what, sit down at your tank for a few hours, uh, even if you have a fishing pole. Sit out there and find out what, what's going on. Because you can't, you, you can't learn anything unless you sit for hours. This is a good time of year to do that. Uh, again, everything is seems like if it creates a problem, it's uh, uh, protected by the Migratory Treaty Act. Uh, that's between Canada and the United States and Mexico. That applies to the buzzards, which are really a serious problem this time of year uh, with calving. And during the winter, uh, we have a lot of them come down with the buzzards. And then during the summer, you know, we've got to just look at everything because we're kind of in the middle of all that, which makes, you know, even in the cormorant. I know they're supposed to be good for something, and so are mosquitoes, just because they happen to fall in a migratory <coughs> classification. Uh, that means they're protected. Uh, the egrets, again, they're pretty hard to do. Uh, once again, I would suggest sitting around watching. You would learn so much just by watching. You can't learn that on the PBS channel. If you sit on or you know, go out and sit on, on the bank, you learn 10 times what that show would teach you. They, uh, again, you would learn pretty much, you know, they feed both day and night. They're colony nesters. Uh, they're feeding shallow water. Again, some of the, the methods power techniques, uh, the lasers, the lethal control by shooting. Once again, you have to contact your county agent, you contact us, and, and we can definitely help you. We've got kingfishers up here, off-spray and turn. Some people in the right place are, are the wrong place, the wrong situation. That could have an effect on your, your situation, but that's really not that likely. I mean, that is, it can happen, but are they going to dramatically reduce your numbers? Probably not. Again, this is that migratory bird deal I was talking about. It covered a whole lot of birds just because they happened to slip in there. You know, but we had to make an agreement. And so when we made an agreement with Mexico and Canada, that just kind of, you know, okay, we want to shoot the buzzards, but y'all quit shooting the eagles. So kind of fell in. Uh, a lot of animals fell into this. This is our Form 37. The government can't really realize that all of y'all have a problem or any of y'all have a problem unless it's reported. If you don't report it to us, we can't report it to the government, therefore we don't have a problem. And they'll reduce that, that number that we're allowed to take because they can't really be that much problem. You know, in one in two years it's reported a problem. So it makes it more difficult to be able to get a, a permit. 